Okay, thank you, Jakob. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about where we might want to be in 2030. So, we kind, of, we kind of have an idea maybe about where we are now, but where would we like to be? And before I, before I kick off, I wonder if anybody knows what that is a picture of. Anybody want to have a guess? There's a few clues on the, on the slide. I'll, I'll show you another picture of, of that same event in a couple of slides. Um, without dwelling on it, I just wanted to say a couple of words about JISC. So if you've not come across this before, um, I think Kevin mentioned yesterday, we, we fund the DCC. Um, we're quite active in a lot of these open science projects. Um, things like OpenAir, UDAT, we're also involved in CASRI, and we do a whole bunch of other things. So if, you're, if your world is open science, you'll probably know us through that. Uh, other things that we do are running the Janet Network in the UK, the UK's um, internet backbone for colleges and universities. We also run um, Edgerome in the UK. So. It's quite nice to come here and bang, immediately I'm on the internet and this is something we start to take for granted. So th these are the kind of things that JISC does in, in the UK. Um, but I want to take you to 2030 and let's imagine it's 29th of May 2030. Who knows what uh, Valus Marinus is? Anyone want to hazard a guess? It's on Mars. So let's imagine it's, it's the 29th of May 2030 and the sons of Musk land on Mars. Elon Musk's <laughs> sons are the first humans on Mars. And hey, you know, this, this is the beginning, but very quickly Mars tourism becomes established. People are taking the cabin lift up to the top of Olympus Mons. Um, that, that's the kind of thing we might like to imagine. And what I wanted to do today was to, to um, stimulate a little bit of uh, thinking and maybe some discussion about how, how do we get there. And actually, there's a very big thing here, which is this guy and, and all his works, he's in it to make a buck. And a lot of what we do in the science community is about expanding human knowledge. It's about sharing things for the greater good. Um, but actually, there are, there are people who are trying to make a buck as well, and I think that's an important theme that I'll, I'll keep coming back to. So where I wanted to start with this is what I've called No More Secrets, and this is a bit more Elon Musk. Elon Musk decided that patents were a really bad thing, so he said, right, wherever feasible, I'm going to share the designs for the stuff that I do, so share the designs for all the Tesla um, electric cars. In the world of space, and there's that picture again, that's the, the first stage um, rocket launcher returning to Earth. So he's not managed to do this yet, but I'm sure in the next 15 years, if he doesn't go bust first, he'll manage to land that first stage rocket booster, and that will completely change the economics of getting into space. Maybe it will make that Mars trip feasible. Maybe it will make it feasible for someone here today to go on holiday on Mars before they, before they die. Um, unfortunately, Elon Musk there with, with SpaceX is on a collision course with another internet billionaire, Jeff Bezos from, from Amazon. And what, what I'm showing you on the left there is um, the patent trial, essentially the patent trial documents for Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin Company versus Elon Musk's SpaceX. So these guys are fighting it out literally right now over that first stage rocket booster reusable technology. So Blue Origin have a patent on it which Elon Musk is trying to have thrown out. So it would be nice if there were no more secrets and a lot of what we're talking about in open science is, is Let's get all the information out there. Let's get reproducible trials, reproducible studies. Ultimately, where is this stuff going to go? A lot of it is hopefully going to go into translation into industry. It's going to be exploited and turned into products and services. And that's something 
again, we might not particularly want to think about it if we're scientists, if we think about it from, from a researcher's perspective. Perhaps we're more interested in the science, we're more interested in, in human knowledge. But, you know, maybe you, maybe you want to make a buck at the end of the day too. So, we'll see how that pans out. I'm imagining that by 2030 they've ironed out their differences and maybe they've agreed to share some technology. And that's the diagram, by the way. This is what they're fighting over. And th this illustrates how an idea can be quite a divisive thing. It would be nice if that was just something that was open and shared, the design for the reusable first stage rocket booster. And hey, you know, Elon Musk said, we're just giving these things away. We used to have a wall of patents. We're giving them away. Anybody can make this stuff now. That actually means that you guys can pick that stuff up. So in the past, he would have patented it, he would have locked it away, and he would have said, well, you know, unless you're one of my favorite collaborators, no access. But no, we're giving it away. So actually, there's a circle there, potentially, from the, the ideas and the inventions that came out of the research community, some of which he picked up, to products and services, and then back into the research community again. You could pick these things up, and you could reuse them. So where I, where I kind of see us now is a little bit like the, the wagon trains crossing the United States all those hundreds of years ago. We're the pioneers. And in a, an event like this, we'll hear a lot of talk about some of those projects I mentioned already. There's actually quite, quite a few of them. All of these things had to happen because no one knew how to share um, scientific outputs. No one knew how to share them in a way that was discoverable. No one knew, them, knew how to share them in a way that was reproducible. We're learning how to do that right now. And I was particularly taken, I, I grabbed that from the Open Air website yesterday. That's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of stuff, but we're still pioneers. And I think I saw a figure of around 450,000 researchers working in, in just the life sciences in Europe um, a couple of days ago. You think about those 450,000 researchers, when all their stuff is open access, when all their data is open, when their code is open, these outputs that we're starting to pull together, and literally we're just starting to do this, those numbers will increase really dramatically. And what I think is very interesting about this is a lot of the pioneering, pioneering work has to be done by what Business Town here would call an intrapreneur. So this is basically somebody who has an itch to scratch. You maybe you're sat in a university, maybe you're sat in a library in university, and you're there saying, "Ah, we know we want to do this. Actually, how do we make it work?" If you've not seen it, Business Town is is um, quite a quite a cute little thing. It's it's all about um, imagining how different roles in our modern um, environment are um, carried out using the medium of cartoon animals. So it's kind of fun. I, I'm painting myself as the captain of moonshots here, but you could easily be one of these entrepreneurs who's sitting there saying, right, I now have access to a global audience through perhaps one of these EU projects we are going to work together and we are going to figure out how to solve the metadata problem. We're going to figure out how to solve the citation of data problem or one of these other tricky tasks. So Pioneers is where we are now. But, and I think you got a little bit of a flavor of it yesterday, um, for example, from Elsevier, that the, what, what Adam Smith called the invisible hand is starting to make an impact on the sector. So we're not just entrepreneurs anymore. Now we have actual products and services to help us do the open science. And this is now, and these things are really in their infancy. If we think forward to 2030, then it's quite possible that a lot of the stuff that we struggle to do right now will just be available off the shelf as products and services. So I picked a few clippings here. Here's when Macmillan launched Digital Science, which is the home of Figshare. We heard from, from Daniel yesterday. Um, we've done a little bit of mergers and takeovers. So it turns out that 
Um, we've got Macmillan, we've got the teaming up with um, S Springer, we've got the whole situation when Elsevier bought up Mendeley, so a lot of the open science startup activities have suddenly become quite big business, but they're still small in terms of overall numbers. Remember those 450,000 people working in the life sciences in Europe? Only a tiny fraction of them are using a service like Mendeley or a service like Figshare. So there's a huge potential. Some of these things will, will probably become the way that you do your open science. But I think what will also happen is that we'll find that there are niche, niche cases where you need a kind of community approach. So it doesn't actually make sense. There is no viable business proposition. Um, so we'll see about that. But in the meantime, we have a whole bunch of disruptive stuff coming along which has nothing to do with science and everything to do with politics and economics. And I've, I've called that Brexit, Brexit, Spexit. And if you, if you follow the news, then of course you will have been reading about things like this in the UK. Our Bank of England has been um, planning what would happen if um, the UK pulled out of the EU. Well, they have to plan these things, but the way that that's leaked out um, implies that they're assuming that this will happen. And well, boom, poor, poor old David Cameron goes to EU talks and no one wants to talk to him. This is a shame. <laughs> um, and we get reports like this in the Wall Street Journal. Actually, can, can the EU survive as um, a Eurozone? Maybe the EU will turn into a trade federation. Why is that important for people here? Well, let's just think about uh, Horizon 2020. So there's an expectation that there will be a, something like a Horizon 2020, and you know, it probably won't be called Horizon 2025 or Horizon 2030, it will probably have a new name. But how much of these um, geopolitical influences will affect that? And the answer is actually it could have a, a, a huge effect. So you might need to find some kind of new patron. But there is a silver lining. So this, this guy writing in, in The Guardian in the UK says, well, actually, you know, maybe, maybe we could kind of cancel Eurovision. It's sort of embarrassing. So maybe there's a silver lining. And in the UK, um, we have a particular concern, which is about the way that universities and colleges are funded. And the government department that funds them, there's been a lot of discussion lately about, well, will this continue to exist? Because the government has a whole bunch of areas which are ring-fenced, where funding is guaranteed. Actually, this is one area where that doesn't apply. So the, our government is going to make lots more austerity cuts, and this sector is, is where a lot of those cuts are going to fall, we think. So seven and a half billion pounds, that's, that's a big number. And maybe there will be some protests. If anybody's ever watched Father Ted, you might recognize the slogan on the, on the placard over there, down with this sort of thing. So I think you might find that there are new patrons. And what, what do I mean by patrons? Well, I mean people like uh, Google. We talked about Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos earlier on. Google, Amazon, Microsoft, the, these people already actually make awards of time on their clouds, compute time. Some of them, like Google, make awards that look very much like research grants. And it's kind of a natural progression, if you think about it. Follow the money. Where, where has the money gone? And actually, in our society, an awful lot of the money has gone to these guys. So it's not unreasonable for us to come to them and say, well, actually, you know, the f supply of funds from government to do this kind of stuff to do the science, to share the results. If that starts to dry up, well, perhaps we'll find that we're turning increasingly to patrons, and you know, maybe Mark Zuckerberg will fund your next research project. That might be a little weird, if you're, particularly if you're in social sciences. Um, and, oh, yes, actually, he is funding research projects right now. Um, in digital citizenship, by the way, so think about that one. Um, I think we should keep in mind that patronage is nothing new, and that's how a lot of science got started. 
is a nice paper, and I'll, I'll tweak a link to these slides later on. This is a nice little paper that, for, from my perspective in the UK, tells me a little bit about how patronage got established in science in the UK, but it was all over. This is how science got started. Someone wealthy and powerful said, I'm going to put some of my money into what you're doing. And it's actually only quite recently that governments have started to do that as a, as a national priority. So I wouldn't overstate this. I'm sure that there will still be some government funding for research. But I suspect that we'll see quite a, quite a change in the landscape. And hey, the UK was a cultural <coughs> backwater back then. And hope, hopefully less so now. So what I think we'll, we'll see a lot more of is this awful word, cooperation, And it's, it's really about how people with competing interests can find ways to work together. And to give you a good example here, um, people, people may have seen this before, this landmark report called Goodbye to Berlin, where some analysts had produced a report for Elsevier that essentially said, you know what? open access, we thought this was going to be a real problem, but actually we seem to be doing quite well out of it. And if you look at um, their share prices, I, I cheekily suggested at a, at a conference I spoke at a few months ago that we should all be buying shares in Elsevier, so they're doing brilliantly out of uh, the transition to open access. You can see the graph there with their share price in the last couple of years is just going up and up and up. Um, but the truth is, our fates are intertwined. If you're a researcher, you want to publish in one of the high-impact journals that folk like this publish. You want to see your stuff there. And we actually all have a vested interest in working together, even though uh, we, we don't want to pay a huge amount, let's say, in journal subscriptions or article processing charges to get our stuff out there. Um, well, I particularly proud of, but we've done it just recently, and hopefully this will be mod modelled and replicated across um, the, the entire publishing landscape, is to do deals with publishers to offset <coughs> subscription fees with article processing income. So if I pay to publish, if I pay to make my article open access, then my subscription as an institution is reduced. And I think this could, be, this could be a way for publishers and researchers and institutions to find a way of working together. And often we talk about things like predatory publishers, these evil publishers, they're, they're trying to screw all my money out of me. Um, but actually, publishers have the back catalogue, and I think this is often overlooked. So by 2030, I want the entire back catalogue digitised, I want to be able to find stuff uh, you know, it's not enough to just scan a whole bunch of old papers in old journals. Some of those papers are going to be very important, and we need to apply all the same techniques to them that we would to a born digital paper that was written yesterday. So I think, I think we, in the open science community, need to work together. I think it is publishers and researchers, it's not an either or. Um, so I kind of wanted to round up at this point by summarising a few of the things that I just talked about. So I think we're in this pioneer stage right now. Pioneers will move on. So open access is becoming established practice. And we were just talking about in, in Poland that you're on the beginnings of that journey. I think in the UK we're quite far along. Open access will become just a thing that we do. Open data right now is the big challenge and it's been really good to hear all the conversations here yesterday and I'm looking forward to day two. Open data will be a solved problem and it may be that, for example, what Figshare is doing works for a huge proportion of the cases that people are actually trying to solve and the niche cases can be met by um, little niche services that we build for ourselves. It may well be that we crack the research data problem, and I would suggest that the next big problem, that one down the bottom, is all around reproducibility and reuse. There's something particularly about code reuse 
Uh, I do some work with Rolls-Royce in England and they have to be able to reproduce the computer models of their jet engines while the engine is in flight. So while the engine is still in a plane and the plane is still flying, they have to be able to reproduce their CFD models that they use to verify the engine. And that could be 50 years. So think about that. What, what software that you know from 50 years ago you could run now. So I, I think that will be a huge challenge for us and it will make, it will make open access and open data look, look quite simple by comparison. And why reproducibility? I don't know, a few of you may have seen this tweet from the Dryad conference from a few days ago. You probably can't make it out actually on there. The guy's showing a slide which has um, 29 different um, attempts to reproduce a study. So this is the same data. Everyone's had access to the paper that describes how the study was done. They're all trying to reproduce the study and they all get quite different answers. So I think reproducibility and code reuse will be those new challenges. So, you know, maybe we'll have cracked research data by 2020 and we'll maybe we'll spend the, 20, the 2020 to 2030 figuring out how to crack reproducibility and, and code reuse. But I think it's very important to keep in mind that bit that I started on, the industrial exploitation, that isn't the only thing that will happen to your um, research data. You share your research data, actually that means you can keep it. When you move from one institution to another, you still have access to it. If you share your software, if you share your research data, if you share your lab notebooks, if those are all open access, they're not the property of any one institution. They don't belong to one research group or anything like that. They belong to everybody, and that means they belong to you. So when you move from one university to another, if you move into industry, you still have access to them. And I think that's really powerful. And maybe we will all end up being funded by, you know, Larry Page and Mark Zuckerberg. That would be kind of a, an interesting thing to imagine. But that's enough from me. I don't know, do we have a moment or two for questions? Okay, so you're now leaving the future. <laughs> um, fire away. Very good example, actually, which um, maybe one or two of you have heard about, just announced yesterday. Um, Google just had their developer conference, and they announced a new product called Google Photos. And Google Photos is a way of organizing your photo collection, but it's a little bit different to all the other tools that you've used before, because it uses uh, deep neural networks to look at what's in your photos. So not just where they were taken, when they were taken. Um, it can tell you things like, show me a picture of my dog. Okay, here's your dog. And, and I, I, I saw that this morning on Twitter, and I thought, well, okay, now. <laughs> you know, we're not, I think, psychologically prepared for some of these things yet. And um, in the world of science, well, okay, there's all sorts of spurious um, um, issues around correlation versus causation. People are want to try and mix data sets and draw all kinds of conclusions from them. Um, but, you know, not, a, not all of those conclusions are valid, and I'm sure we will see a lot more of that. I'm looking forward to indexing my photo collection later on. <laughs> <laughs> 